Hey everyone, and welcome to the Eagle Eye Podcast, presented by Nissan, Ruben Frank, and Dave Zangaro. Rube, it's raining quite a bit. Yeah, it's not the nicest day out ever. It's cold and raw, rainy, a lot of flooding up here in Bucks County. A little bit of flooding out my backyard I'm looking at right now. Really? Yeah. You can see your backyard from where you're sitting? Yeah, I have a window right here, over here. Okay, interesting. I can see my backyard as well. I can't see yours, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's kind of funny. You and I were just talking before the show started. You know, it things have calmed down a little bit in the NFL calendar. We got through the initial blitz of free agency. Then we get through the owners' meetings, which is always kind of a really busy time. It's a little bit of a lull right now, but that this time is going to be filled pretty quickly with a lot of draft stuff. Yeah, we were just having that conversation back in the green room, and and uh, I don't know if people know we have a Eli podcast green room, but um, yeah, it, it's funny because like when free agency starts, it's like God, somebody make this breaking news. Stop! This is too much. It's crazy. Now we're like. Like, I'll take anything, you know, like, like, you know, just like cut somebody off the practice squad. There's no practice squad, but you know what I mean? Um, it, it does get, but you're right. I mean, the draft is six weeks away. I mean, we're, you know, it, it is a little bit of a lull, but uh, we'll fill it with um, mock draft after mock draft. <laughs> yeah, it is a fun time, though, because it, it's going to ramp up. And the draft is always a really exciting time of the year. And it's draft month now. It's April. So. We're almost there. Uh, we have a few weeks until we actually get to the draft. The Eagles have eight picks this year and uh, three really high picks, one in the first round, two in the second round. So a lot of our time over the next few weeks is going to be looking at the draft. But today we have – Since 94, they've had three picks in the top 55, which is interesting. Do they make three picks in the top 55? I don't think so. Okay. but That's we'll a, a, a topic for another day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. We had, you know, the weekend to think about Hassan Reddick a little bit more. So I'm curious to see if we have any new thoughts or if we've changed our opinions from our emergency podcast on Friday. We're going to look at the first round, that number 22 overall pick, and try to figure out which positions make the most sense for the Eagles. But we do have some news to start the show. Reed Blankenship has a one-year contract extension. He's now under contract through the 2025 season. Yeah, and I, one interesting thing about this time of year is that you, you start to learn what they think of different players. If there's a guy they're not trying to resign, whether if, if it's a guy that they give some money to. And I think there's been some – look, Reed Blankenship did not have a good second half of the season. And I think there was some – I don't know. There's some question about exactly where he fit in in the safety hierarchy uh, going into the offseason. Uh he played really well his rookie year in that four games, and he played really well early in the season. Um, and the fact that they just gave him – look, this isn't a huge thing. They didn't give him a ton of money. Um, it's not really an extension from the standpoint of they held his they held his rights for, four, the, for the same – they're holding his rights for the same amount of time. They just gave him some money. Um, it's technically an extension because it, it does make his existing contract longer. Uh, but – uh, it does tell you that they that they like him and that they feel like he's a part of things to you know to to some degree. It doesn't look. It's not enough money to lock him into to anything, uh, but it does tell you that they um, they'd rather he's here than not here. Yeah. So basically, he was undrafted in 2022. So undrafted players after their second season are eligible for a contract extension. And with him, this basically just avoids the restricted free agent process. He would have been a restricted free agent after this upcoming season. So it basically says he's not going to become a restricted free agent. He'll now become an unrestricted free agent after the 2025 season. And by then, I think we'll really know who Reed Blankenship is, right? Like we'll know if he's a starter. We'll know if he's a backup player. We'll know kind of what his ceiling could be. I don't know if we really know any of those things right now. I think that's fair, and, and I, I, I've seen enough good things to, to – I feel pretty confident about him, but what happened at the end of last year did – I mean, some missed tackles, um, you know, some some blown coverages, 
Um, but again, like we talked about this, like with everybody, ha- ha- how much stock do you put into the person, to, to the individual, or to just this whole team wide malaise that that really just overtook the locker room uh, the last two months of the season? Um, I think he's, I think he's pretty good. I think he's always going to be limited by his. Um, he's just not a, a fast. He's not, you know, fast and he's physical. Um, he said something interesting. I thought we talked to him. I don't know if you mentioned we talked to him today on a on a Zoom call. He's I'm, I'm going to play the same way, like as long as my body holds up. And it's interesting that he's thinking that way because he's you know he's not the biggest guy and he does play the game. I don't say recklessly, but he's a very physical guy. He loves to just come up and support the run. He's a big hitter, and uh, he, you know he he is a guy that I mean we've talked about this with like Avante and just some guys are just I mean, he's not like that size, but um, he's a guy that the way he plays the game, uh, he could have a a shorter career or a shorter period of of being productive. So I think that all goes into it. Um, but I love his approach. I love the way he he, you know, the effort and and the the physicality that he brings. Uh, and he's a playmaker. I mean, he's got what four interceptions in fifteen played fifteen games, so nineteen nineteen games. So that's good production. So uh, there's a lot to like about him. But yeah, you're right. We we don't really know exactly who he is as a player yet. Yeah, I feel pretty confident saying he's an NFL player. He's proven that, right? He, he went from being an undrafted guy. It was kind of an afterthought when the Eagles signed him. At least the Eagles kind of viewed him like that based on what they paid him. And then he he makes the team. He's a good story, gets some time on, on special teams, and then eventually plays a big role down the stretch as a rookie uh, when C.J. Gardner-Johnson got hurt. And then last year when C.J. left and when Marcus Epps left, all of a sudden reads the starter – and I think, you know, he wasn't a star player, but he offers a solid baseline level of play, right? I, I think he was okay. He led the team in tackles and interceptions, which probably speaks more about the team than him. But I think at least, you know, we were getting with Reed Blankenship, right? Like, I don't think he's going to be an all pro in the NFL, but you can do worse. And if they ever get to a situation where he's the third guy, I feel like that would be really great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the fact that he's, uh, he's around the ball and he, like, he catches interceptions that are thrown to him. Like a lot of guys, I mean, we've seen on this team guys in position, CJ's like that too, but I mean, there's, there's guys that just don't make those plays no matter the ball could be in their hands. I like that, that he's got, uh, he's got that ability to finish those plays and um, three interceptions when your whole team, the rest of the whole, whole rest of the roster at six last year. <laughs> so that's, you know, he was the only guy making those kind of plays really. Um, so that, that, that speaks well, I think. Uh, yeah, you're right. He'll always be in the league. He'll, I mean, at the very minimum, he'd be a really good special teamer and, and backup safety. Uh, so um, it's just whether, you know, what level of consistency he can give you as a starter, I, I think potentially pretty good level. And a, Again, it's going to help if he has, you know, he had better people around him in 22 and he played better. So I think that's part of it too. Yeah, I think that's right. Monday was a good day for Reed. It was. He gets He gets his contract extension. And then earlier in the day, we found out he was second in the NFL in performance-based pay take-home, which is a big deal. He made an extra $923,000. So he made more in performance-based pay than he did – his base salary last year. Yeah. Do you want to explain exactly what that is and how it works and how it's determined? Sure. Without like getting into the weeds, it's basically um, a program that started in, in the early 2000s between the NFL and the NFL PA. And it's like extra money. Uh, and it's kind of to, to give players who have lower salaries, but play a lot, some extra money. And that's basically what it means. So like if, if you're a player like Reed Blankenship, who has a low salary and you played an awful lot of snaps, it helps you out and you get more money. And it's it, like the, the pool is just like a big pool of money. And then it gets split up 32 times evenly. So he gets a, a big portion of the Eagles chunk. But everyone like Jalen Hurts will get money. Like everyone pretty much gets some money. It's just a matter of how much. 
Yeah, and it's really not performance based; it's playing time based. Mm -hmm. They call it performance based pay, but it's based on, as far as I understand it, is based solely on snaps. Just snaps. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the level of play. Yeah, so the the name performance based pay is really a, a, a misnomer. It's really playing time based pay, uh, and yeah, for a guy like him who was undrafted and signed not only a minimum wage deal, but he got what five thousand up front. I think was his bonus when he yeah. signed. Um, it's huge, and uh, you know, I mean, like you said, he what was his base like eight hundred and eight seventy, eight seventy, and he's got nine over nine hundred in, in this this money. So he's doubling his pay. Um, it's a good program, and it uh, it clears up some inequities in in the system, and and it does not count towards salary cap. I get a bunch of those questions. It's it it do, it has nothing to do with that. Yeah, yeah. So good for him, and maybe he'll buy a tractor or lawnmower. He could. He could buy a few. A push mower. <laughs> just, it's just he's he's a modest guy. I, I could see Reed with a push mower. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a push mower. Nothing wrong with a push mower. Yeah. Good so he, he right makes guy. a little bit of extra money there, and some contract details from our buddy Mike Garofolo. Um, Over the next two seasons, he already money coming to him, uh, just under four million dollars for Reed on this deal, uh, and then a bunch of playtime and Pro Bowl escalators. Mike called them, which is important because escalators are different than incentives. Escalators count, and then they count on every subsequent year of the deal. So um, $375,000 for 70%, $625,000 for 80%, $875,000 for 90%, and then a $500,000 uh, escalator for if he makes the Pro Bowl, which probably unlikely, but good for him. And in a situation where like we think he's a starter right now, and there are no guarantees. It's probably nice for him to to get some incentivized pay in there. Yeah, true. And um, as Dave said, just to clarify, like, so say you have, for instance, four years left on your contract at two million dollars a year, and you you hit an escalator in that first year. Each base salary is going up by that amount um, for the rest of the contract. So uh, it's it's it is it's a more powerful uh, backside protection than than just an incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it look doesn't come up an awful lot, but I like the the inner workings of NFL contracts. Yeah, that's something we we have you know, we we share something we have in common. Not, there's not a lot of things. Dave likes comedians. I don't like comedians. I like indie rock. Dave doesn't really like indie rock. That's not true. We both like contract details. Yeah. Uh, you like movies. I don't really like movies. This is the rest of the show. We'll just say things that I like and you don't like. We could probably fill a show with the things that we differ Part on. two coming up Thursday. <laughs> what do you make of the Eagles' safety situation? Because CJ Garner-Johnson, clearly a starter. They paid him starter money. He's going to be out there. Right now, Reed's the other guy. There's a chance maybe they add someone else. Sidney Brown coming back from that ACL is kind of the wild card. Yeah. What do you make of the, the spot in general? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. I think you feel you feel more confident in Reed being a starter than you did two days ago, um, but it still I don't think precludes them from adding uh, from adding competition, from adding um, some talent. Um, man, it's just a shame about Sidney Brown because look, he 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 had some issues last year. I mean, his obviously his tackling, he had, took some bad angles, missed some tackles, but. Um, he showed me enough to think there's something there. I mean, you know, he's got some ability, and you can get better. You can get better at the things he needs to get better at. Um, so that's a shame. And you know, we hope we see. We don't really know. I mean, we don't have any any idea um, when we'll see him. Uh, uh, at some point, he'll play this year. But um, I do, I do think they're still they're not going to draft a safety in the first round. But I think there's um, certainly. Uh, a chance they'll add to the position over over the next few months. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and CJ's a versatile player. He obviously wants to play safety. He's made that pretty clear. But in a pinch, it, it does help having him because he can. And he'll he'll like he'll have to play as the slot on occasion anyway, even as a starting safety. So I, I don't think it's like a big leap to think that his versatility can help them. And if they keep adding at the safety position. You can use that versatility even more. 
Yeah, that's true. And that's one thing we know that Vic likes is guys that can do a lot of different things and those interesting pieces that you can move around and, and uh, give you unlimited different combinations. And uh, Reed's not really like that, but I mean, he's not going to play corner. Um, we know that, but, uh, but yeah, um, it, it, it's funny because like how the way how he looks at the roster is so different than I think other people like he, he's not thinking, Oh, we don't need a safety. We got these guys. He's like, this guy's a good player. I'm going to bring him in and, and, and let's figure it out. So sometimes they, these things don't make outward sense. You're like, why are you doing that? But I think his thing is like, let's just bring in as many good players as we can. Um, now within reason, you're not going to go draft three quarterbacks, but, um, but yeah, it would not surprise me if, if he does add, um, add some pieces. I mean, cause they don't have any depth. I mean, um, who's the next guy after the, you know, going into camp, well, Sydney's not going to be in camp. Um, Tristan McCollum, Tristan McCollum, who I think he might've played in one game on defense last year. Yeah, they have Makai Garner, who yeah. played some safety. Maybe a full time switch could be in order for him. Could be. Kind of looks like a safety. Yeah, he's a big dude. That's the first thing I noticed about him when they got him in the to camp. Was like, wow, this guy is enormous. Yeah. The the, the Sydney Brown thing is something to me that like I look back at last season, and it was a shame he he had like a soft tissue injury early in the year, and then the the Avante Maddox injury happened. So he finally gets to play, and he's out of position playing yeah. nickel corner. And there were how many games where it was Justin Evans out there, Terrell Edmonds out there. And I think back, like, man, that was just such a wasted opportunity for him to get playing time because he needs it. Like, I, I know he played quite a bit in college, but you watch him, and he plays with his hair on fire, which is good and sometimes bad. But I, I think he needs the experience, and it feels like it was a wasted opportunity to get him that early last year. Yeah, and they just seem – I think it's a Nick thing. I remember I asked him about this, and he didn't he didn't go along with the idea, but they just seem like they'd rather wait till young guys are – get some seasoning, get some – really know that – I mean, Keely Ringo didn't play early. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was um, – they just don't like playing young guys, maybe first round picks, but even Nolan, we didn't think Nolan played enough. But I mean, how many times do we have that conversation on the pod that why isn't Sydney playing? I mean, do we really need to see Justin Evans out there? And Justin Evans might have been a little bit, maybe a little bit better than Sydney at, in early September, but he's not part of your future. Uh, maybe their thing is, well, we're, we're trying to win a Super Bowl here. We're not trying to, you know, we don't have time to develop guys, but. Uh, I just didn't get it. The, there's no way Sean Desai couldn't have found uh, reps for 10, 12 reps a game for Sidney Brown. Yeah, I agree. And, like, uh, I think Desai was more willing to rotate at some non-traditional rotational positions than Jonathan Gannon was. But you're right. Like, the last two yeah. years, they, they've they really been hesitant to play their young players. And, like, on one hand, you understand it, but there has to be a little bit more of a balance here. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a tricky thing because uh, uh, it's fine line uh, because, yeah, I mean, if you're sitting there 10 and 1, it's like, let, let, let's go play these untested rookies. You're not going to do that. But um, there's a point there's a point where guys have to play and you can find snaps for them. You can find ways to use them. And Sydney, like, I think everyone would have understood if he blew a play here and there. It was, like, inevitable with the way he was playing – Right. Uh, like he plays with this like frantic hair on fire style. You're going to give up plays here and there, but he would have made some too. Like that 99 yard interception return we saw late in the year. Like I feel confident he would have made some plays if he would have gotten on the field earlier. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And you can, you can live with a couple of blown plays. If, if a guy is making plays like that, because they didn't really have anyone else making those kind of plays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That's all I had on safety. Uh, I do want to circle back to Hassan Reddick because we talked about him on Friday. We did an emergency episode of the podcast. It ruined my opening day. I was really looking forward to watching the Phillies game. I mean, maybe I dodged a bullet there because 
it was two two when we started that podcast, and I looked up and it was nine two. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. It was it was literally two two when we started the podcast. Because mm-hmm. I was in I was in the parking garage at Suburban Square in Ardmore. And when we were done, I went and checked the score, and they were down nine to two. I mean, they literally allowed seven runs during a podcast, which might be a record. It might be. I was like, you know, maybe they were invoking Matt Patricia. And... <laughs> Our new bullpen coach, Matt Patricia. <laughs> a very qualified candidate. Uh, Probably the most qualified. Hassan Reddick, I we talked about it on Friday. And the last time we talked, I don't think I've changed too much. I, there was this feeling of inevitability that he would get moved, but I still don't think I like they are clearly a worse team after trading a son Reddick than they were before. And it's a risk. I, I think it's a calculated risk, right? Like I think there is some sense to it. They're getting younger. They're theoretically paying Bryce Huff less. They added what could be a second round draft pick. So like all of that, makes some sense i just still think it's a gamble uh to not keep hassan reddick now i know it would have cost money but i'm still not sure i wouldn't have rather paid hassan reddick instead of doing everything else if that was an option yeah yeah um i don't know how much of an option like i don't know what they would have had to give him to so like I don't think you can keep him and just pay him what he was going to be paid. No, I don't think that was on the table. I think it was either you, 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 you you trade him or you come up with a new contract. He certainly wasn't going to play on that deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what it would have taken to, to make him happy. Um, I, I don't disagree with you. I think there's a chance it won't be that that bad. I mean, it really depends on what you get from Bryce Huff. Um, and he know. might be great. We might all, we might look back at this in a couple of years and say, man, Bryce Huff was a steal. They got an ascending player. They paid him way under market. The jets bottomed out in, in 2025 and the Eagles have the you know, 37th pick yeah. in the draft. Like all that is very possible. Right. From where I sit right now, it's it's a lot of risk involved in that. Would it be worth it if if Bryce Huff gives you, let's say, let's say Reddick has thirteen sacks next year, and Bryce Huff at seven at seventeen at like eight million cheaper, assuming Reddick signs a new deal like in the twenty five million range, um, and and Bryce Huff gives you eight and a half sacks. Is it, was that then? Then it, does that kind of make it okay? Like, what does what does Bryce Huff have to do to make it worthwhile? Yeah, it, I'll tell you one thing. It puts a heck of a lot of pressure on Bryce Huff, whether he wants to recognize that or not. It does. They're replacing a guy who a couple of years ago was in the Defensive Player of the Year running. I voted for him third, I believe. Yeah, and then, I mean, heck, he outplayed the defensive player of the year in the NFC Championship game. Sure did. Uh, he, he was tremendous that year. I think – and the, we talked about this on the Friday pod. The kind of funny thing about it is you have to root for a son Reddick if you're an Eagles fan this year because that being a second-round pick is tied to his performance this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's – I don't really disagree with you. I think you're a better team with him. Um, I think I probably feel like there's a better chance it'll work out in the Eagles' favor than you do, um, but it is a risk, and and uh, I, I agree with that part of it. Um, do you think there's a disconnect with how? No, clearly there is, but a disconnect with how the Eagles view Reddick versus how perhaps I or some fans do, because like to me, he's a player who's worth going over twenty mil a year. Even with his age, I think you can be an effective edge rusher into your thirties, especially because, I mean, he didn't really play a lot of the position early in his career. Um, I think he's worthy of a you know top ten, top five money at the spot. The Eagles clearly didn't because they could have done that theoretically. Yeah, and 
look, I mean, that might be the reason that they didn't just give him a few extra million and make him happy for the last year of his deal because they didn't want him here. I mean, sure seems that way. I mean, I'm sure they could have come up with a deal to keep him. I don't know where that number would have been, somewhere between what he was supposed to get and what he's going to get. You know, would if he would he have stayed for if they bumped him up to twenty million? Would he have been happy? I think um, it was probably twenty two million imperative that he got another year. Probably, although I mean the the if you can get twenty million and still be a free agent at thirty, he he might have been okay with that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I wonder if some of it is just that they they feel with, I mean, maybe they like Nolan Smith more than we can imagine. Maybe they feel like Josh Sweat in, you know, with a real coordinator and, you know, we'll, we'll bounce back. And they feel like we've got two double-digit, we got two double-digit pass rushers. We have BG, who was a double-digit pass rusher two years ago, is not going to be this year, certainly. And we have a first-round pick. Maybe they just felt, you know what? Why should we pay twenty five million a year when we've got these guys? I, I, I don't totally agree. I don't totally disagree either. So. Yeah, I know. I, I and I, I think the minute they traded him, I went, gosh, they just let Hassan Reddick walk out the door. And I think there's this moment of like, well, how do you let a player that good leave? I I think there is some sense to it. You know, like I, I think there is some good business practice to it when you go a little deeper because you're getting younger, you're paying less, you're getting a draft pick and you add all of it up and you go, okay, like I understand why they did what they did. But then there's this other part of me that goes, he was your best defensive player and he's not here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think those two thoughts in my head have been battling it out all weekend. Really? <laughs> That's an interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 And I mean, the, the reality is we don't know and we won't know for, you know, till till the end of the season. Uh, but I think, you know, it's it's a Howie move. It's a I mean, it's Howie kind of trusting the draft pick, trusting um, sweat, um, you know, trusting the guy he just signed as a free agent. And I'm sure if I mean, was I'm sure, you know, we haven't talked to Howie since the trade. Uh, but I'm sure that's what he would say. He'd say, well, you know, uh, Hassan's a great player. Uh, we feel like we've got really good edge rushers here. And from a, you know, cost-benefit analysis standpoint, I don't know, we, we've, we've got a guy we just drafted in the first round. We've got a guy um, who had 11 sacks. What did, uh, he had 10 sacks last year, Huff. We have a guy who um, was in the Pro Bowl two years ago and had 11 sacks the, the next year. So, uh, I'm sure that's how he's looking at it. Um, we still have good edge rushers. We still have Wash coaching them. Uh, we have a real defensive coordinator in Vic uh, who can get the most out of these guys. Um, and it, it just didn't make financial sense to add another one um, at that number. I, I'm sure that's how he's looking at it. Yeah, I th I think once, you know, they brought in Huff and then they figured out something with Sweat – I think it made it much more likely Reddick was gone. I thought yeah. maybe they'd hold on to him longer and be patient because we've seen how he'd be patient before when he doesn't get the return he wants. I thought maybe there was an avenue where they just, hey, let's just hang on to this guy because it's not there. I don't know how that would have worked with snaps and if Reddick would have been super unhappy. I think that might have been untenable, but that yeah. was kind of my thought process was maybe he'll hang on to him just because the return hasn't been what you want. Uh but so once those other moves were made, I think it was much more likely Reddick was gone. Yeah, but I mean, you said it was over fifty percent; he'd be back um, after all those moves. Yeah, I meant back for the beginning of the season, like yeah. just hang on to the dude because I th you're not getting what you want. Yeah, I do think they're the one. The one kind of dimension of this that is important is that you just don't want a guy in your locker room who's not happy especially a guy who's always going to speak his mind. True. You know, Hassan Reddick's not going to sit back there and say, yeah, I'm I'm having a blast making 15 million <laughs> or whatever. Um, he would, he'd be very vocal about it and I wouldn't blame him. 
Um, but that's who he is. And I think they're very aware of, you know, I don't want to say damage, but the, the effect that having a, an unhappy guy, especially a leader, an older veteran player, a two-time uh, pro bowler um, who the young guys are going to look up to, if he's miserable, um, he's unhappy, he feels like he's being, you know, treated unfairly. Um, that's just not a healthy situation. And I, I think they know that. Yeah, they've been willing to do it before, though. Who are you thinking? Zach Hurts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not it's not that long ago. One of the best players in franchise history. They brought back for a season because they thought, no, nah, we're not getting what we want. It's like the most recent example, and it's and I mean, it didn't go well. You know, I mean, he wasn't making trouble, but it certainly wasn't a good situation. Yeah, they ended up getting Tay Gowan. <laughs> that's that's true. Um, maybe I. I mean, I. I mean, he was obviously very unhappy, and uh, yeah, he's doing a benefit, by the way, um, in Philly for his um, his foundation. I guess that. Um, that uh, home that he that he built, which is really an incredible thing, and Matt from Mount Joy's playing. Uh, oh, very cool. When's yeah. that? I think it's just. Is that the, I think it's at the Phil. Is that the Fillmore? I think it's this weekend, possibly. Oh, really? I should know that. I'll I'll look it up when I have a chance. Okay, uh, I do want to ask you. We, we've talked so much in this Hassan Reddick discussion, really all off season, about Bryce Hoff and about Nolan Smith and how much pressure is on them. Yeah. I feel like we haven't talked a ton about Josh Sweat, aside from when we found out maybe he could be on the move. Where's your confidence level that Sweat can rebound and, and be the Sweat we saw, heck, at times last year and really the, the two years previous? It's pretty high. I, I just think he was a real victim of – you know, that malaise we talked about, eight straight games without a sack, it's not him. Um, I just think it was a really bad – we'll never know how bad it was, but I think it was – I think they had no faith in um, – I don't say no faith in the coaching staff, but I think they didn't have the faith in the coaching staff that they had in previous years. And then when the change came, it was it was kind of – it was over. Um he, he made a Pro Bowl in 2022 or in 2021. He had 11 sacks in 2022 and he had six and a half first half of last year. So through whatever, through like the Buffalo game or whatever it was, he had his last sack last year. He had, um, what do you have, eight and a half sacks in, in 21, something like that. He had 19 and a half and 60 and a half. So he had, he had 26 sacks from the start of 21 to the middle of 23. Um, you, can, you know, that's that's great production. And then I'm not going to let two bad months when the whole team was falling apart, the coaches were changing, uh, you know, it was it was chaos defensively. Uh, I'm not going to let that cloud my opinion of Josh Sweat. Uh, and what I saw is still a young guy, like 26. I mean, it, it seems like it might have clouded – the evaluation of him league wide because he was available for a trade. It didn't happen. And then he really takes a pay cut for this season. So like it, maybe we're not taking it into account, but it seems like the league is right. Yeah. Yeah. That's not surprising. I mean, that's how they, you know, if you're a GM, there's, there's going to be that. And I'm sure people look to film of those last eight games, but um, I've seen enough of Josh Sweat to know what kind of player he is. And I think the real Josh Sweat is the guy we saw from the start of 21 to uh, to the middle of last year. I could be wrong, but I, that's my hunch. And if you had to keep Josh Sweat or Hassan Reddick just from sack celebration, Sweat's sack celebration is better. Even though I did like the Reddick thumbs up, thumbs down thing, the – the sweat brow is, is better. That is a good one. Who had the best one ever? Sack celebration or any celebration? Sack celebration. Oh, um, Eagles, you mean? I don't know. Yeah, sure. 
I don't know. I like, I like Fletch's. Fletch's is pretty good. Um, Trot, obviously. Yeah. Pretty iconic. Yeah. Didn't Trent Cole do the 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 arrow? Yeah, that was a good one. It's good. I thought Hargraves was good. Yeah. Crawl the door and kick it down. Yeah, it was good. Um, John Harris had a really good one. He just never had a chance to use it. It would have been great, though. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. We have a lot on the other side. You deserve a car that thrills you, a car that puts goosebumps on your goosebumps. At Nissan, we got everything from turbocharged SUVs to 100% electric vehicles that will make your heart beat faster. Experience the thrill for yourself and shop your local Nissan store at NissanUSA.com today. Celebrity cook Steve Martorano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martorano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations at Martorano's Prime on Open Table. You know, I actually went to the Phillies game on Saturday. Oh, yeah. And it was uh, it was a nice day, so I just went with one buddy. And we said, let's go to the, the parking lot. We'll hang out and, and eat some lunch. And it's beautiful, sunny. Second, I, I close my uh, my car up, and we're walking in. It starts to rain a little bit. Delayed start, and then I was cold. It was it got chilly on Saturday. Yeah, it did. Those those early those early April games, you just never know what you're going to get weather wise. Yeah, they lost the game, but it was nice to be back to ballpark a little bit. Yeah, where'd you sit? Outfield. Yeah, it's a beautiful park. It really is. It is. It's amazing. It's like it. It's really held up. It's a year older than the link. Yeah. Yeah. Or younger, year younger than the link, I think. Like that. About yeah. the same. Yeah, I think a year younger. I think the link was done first. I could be wrong. Don't correct me on that if I'm wrong. But beautiful park. I like all the those like era parks, like PNC and Pittsburgh, and um, a lot of them have like the similar feel to them, but they're all cool. What's your favorite? I've probably been to about fifteen, I think, over the years. Maybe a little more because some old, some of the older ones. Um, what's your favorite baseball park? Um, it, it's funny because I like it because of what it is, not because it's a good park. I love Wrigley. You really? I didn't really like Wrigley that. Yeah, much. no, it stinks, but it's it's like so iconic that it's it's fun being there. Yeah, like there are some okay. sections of Wrigley where you're like, I can't even see. I have a a cement in front of me or whatever, but it's it's just such a cool park that yeah, it's fun to be there. Yeah. I mean, I'll go Fenway. Uh, I just, you know, my brother is a partial season ticket holder. So I've been up there a few times and, um, you know, and I think one thing that Wrigley and Fenway and some of those parks share is just where they are. Just being in a part of town. Where, neighborhood is fun. Yeah. You know, there's just, there's restaurants and bars and all kinds of stuff to do. And then you just walk over to the ballpark. Um, there's something to be said for that. I've never been up on one of the rooftops near Wrigley and now they're all kind of like you buy tickets to them. Yeah. But I, I've never done that. I've always wanted to do that. They're pretty wild. I mean, they have like bleachers up in the rooftops. Yeah. So uh, I have a buddy who lives out there and, and he had like a, a little bachelor party. Uh, it happened to be during training camp. So I didn't go, but one of the things they had like a few days of events. And one of the things was they like rented out a bunch of, or they got a bunch of seats on one of the rooftops. I thought that would have been fun. Yeah, I, I'm. I don't do well with heights, so I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, if it was like, I'm not sure how I do. Depends how far from the edge I am. Yeah. Happy baseball's back, though. Yeah, it's exciting to to see it and to hear it. I I always get the uh, the uh, extra innings package just because, like, if I'm if I'm home during the day, there's always a day game on somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's just I just find it relaxing to just put a ball game on and whether I'm doing laundry or doing some writing or whatever it is, having a ball game on makes everything better. Last night I had a great sports night. I watched um, the Phillies game. I mean, it didn't, they didn't all end great, but <laughs> watched the Phillies game, uh, watched the flyers. Cause they put the, the giant Russian goalie in net. Saw that. And then uh, I was watching the, the women's basketball game, which was fun. Caitlin Clark's insane. She's insane. Yeah. Crazy good. Oh, okay. 
Did you watch I, any of those? I watched, um, I watched, gosh, what did I watch? Was yesterday Sunday or Monday? Yesterday was Monday. That's <laughs> I think I watched good. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone for much of the evening. Okay. All right, let's move on. Uh, you and I did this independently, trying to figure out what position is most likely for the Eagles in the first round. They have pick number 22 overall. As we know with Howie, it does not mean they're going to pick uh, at number 22. I went back and I looked at their first round picks under Howie. He's made 13 picks in the first round. Uh, four edge players, three defensive tackles, two offensive tackles, two receivers, one interior offensive lineman, and one quarterback. Uh, obviously, 2015 does not go on his resume. That was Nelson Aguilar, but that was under Chip Kelly. So we kind of have an idea here of where he goes most often. And let's see how that helps. Do you want to build up some suspense and work our way from the bottom up? Sure. Now, did you break down O-line into interior and, and OT? I did, yeah. And D-line into edge and interior? I did, yes. Okay, me too. Okay, so I'm going to start at 13 with long snapper. Don't think it's very likely. Uh, at 12, I had punter. At so 11, I went kicker. I'm guessing you didn't do the specialists. Uh, I did not. Do, I did not do the specialists. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, let's start with number 10 then. Now, why do I have why do I have eleven positions? All right, I probably have something twice on here, but I don't know. Um, anyway, um, least likely I have linebacker just because e even if he drafted linebackers every year, there aren't probably aren't going to be any in the first round this year. So I figure it's more likely that he'll take a quarterback just because there's first round worthy quarterbacks in the draft. Okay, I had I had running back here. Yeah. Uh, just because I don't think there is a first round running back. Yeah. Whereas at least like I think there's a chance there might be a first round linebacker. Probably unlikely. Yeah. I actually had linebacker significantly higher than you. I went running back next. Okay. I went quarterback next. I went uh, I, I went quarterback after running back. So those those are my bottom three. Yeah. Uh, I actually had safety um third from the bottom. I had safety fourth from the bottom. Okay, I don't think there is a safety who's going to be picked. I have so I have linebacker uh, fifth from the bottom. I have tight end in in between there because there's one tight end. Yeah. If Brock Bowers is there at twenty two, you got to think about it. Yeah, even if he's there, at starting to drop at seventeen, eighteen, I don't think he will. But if he does, I can't see him getting past Howie. But I have him. He could. I, I mean the. The history of first round tight ends is not great. No, it's not. And we saw with the Eagles, like the way they went after Saquon, it's like, yeah, we don't necessarily value this position a ton, but getting just an elite talent kind of trump that. Yeah. I wonder if they would look at Brock Bowers similarly. I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, I do have tight end next on my list. Okay. So we're we're kind of in agreement on the bottom. Let's work our way up. At five, I had interior offensive line. Um, I had that. Oh, you I know had... what? This is on me. I I missed a position. Okay. I was flummoxed there. Okay. Um, okay. Had... At, at six, I have interior offensive line. Okay. I had that fifth. Okay. Who would you have at sixth? Um, I had D tackle. Okay. I had that at five now. That's the okay. position I forgot, but that's where I would have it. I think there are a couple who make sense. The odds when we both had a different number of positions that you were the one that messed up was really <laughs> slim. I feel really good about this. So we have four positions left and they're the same ones. Yeah. Um, real quick, like why did you have – I guess like it would be pretty shocking if they took a defensive tackle based on their recent years. I feel like it's a position they've addressed <laughs> recently. <laughs> they certainly have. And, and I guess inter-offensive line, like – we we separated them, but there's a chance they could draft a guy who we're listing as an offensive tackle, but he has some guard flexibility. True. And I kind of included that with the tackles. Okay. That's why I had the interior guys so low. I think like Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon's like the one 
in, like true interior guy who would make some sense, but yeah. I don't even know if he makes sense for the Eagles because he's like a, a bigger center. Right. He would have to probably play guard for them unless they want to like change that position post Kelsey. Yeah. Post Kelsey. Was that we at the game Kelsey uh, throughout the first ball and flash? I was, yeah. 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 That was, how was he received? Warmly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kind of like uh, Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox around here. I I actually, I was in the parking lot and I saw him drive up uh, down the road, and I I didn't see him. I was I should have waved him down, but I'm sure he would have come out and had a beer with you. Yeah, I had I had a few beverages. So I could have given him one. <laughs> I saw where his brother Travis. I don't know if you heard his his brother's dating tra- um, the singer uh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> the singer, yeah. Um, they were at um, at Jason's house in in Haverford. Uh, for Easter, okay. So yeah, Taylor was in uh, was out on the main line. It makes sense. Yeah. So just okay. Anyway, top four. Top four. Here we go. Who'd you have it for, or what position you have before? I had wide receiver fourth. Me as well. I don't think it's completely out of the realm of possibility. I think it would cause a little bit of issues. I think if you're going to do this, you probably want to. Extend Devonte Smith first. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. I also think the notion of extending him is, um, I mean, I, I think I think it's going to be. I don't want to say a formality, but I think I, I just can't imagine a scenario where it doesn't get done. Yeah, I agree with you, but I think for appearances' sake, you probably would want to make sure you have that yeah. tied up before you draft the receiver in the first round. It's, it's fair, but like. There is, there are reasons to do it. We've talked about they don't really have that fifth skill guy yet, or they might, but it's not guaranteed. There are receivers who are going to be available in this range that make some sense. Yeah. Well, there's like you know Brian Thomas from LSU. Both Texas guys might be available. I mean, adding a guy like Xavier Worthy, I mean, throw some gasoline on the fire. Yeah. There's no question. There's some intriguing options there. A.D. Mitchell from Texas. Both guys there uh, make some sense. Let's go to three. Who'd you have at three? Uh, I went O-tackle there. I went edge rusher here. Okay. I'd edge second. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there are some players. It's, you know, by most accounts, it's not the best edge rusher class, but uh, Latu from UCLA kind of fits that big body mold. I know there's the medical concerns, but uh, he's a very good edge rusher. Chop Robinson from Penn State. I think would make some sense as a Hassan Reddick replacement. There are players who, who might be available at that spot. And I like the snaps might not be there right now, but you have to think about the future too. And Josh Sweat isn't under contract after this year. So you might look at the future and think, okay, it's Bryce Huff and Nolan Smith. But if you're not sold on Nolan Smith, don't think it's crazy to add another edge rusher. Yeah. And I mean, if they draft another edge in the first round a year after Nolan Smith, um, that's not a good look. I mean, that's kind of an admission that we're not super confident about him. It's, yeah, I guess so. But, I mean, the difference between edge rusher and some other positions is, like, you're going to play these guys, theoretically. Like, you're going to – They didn't play Nolan. <laughs> I know they didn't play him, but you're going to have the opportunity to. You're going to rotate. I don't think that's – that's like an organizational philosophy that will not change. That's true. Regardless of, of who the. But if you board. draft an edge and all of a sudden he's playing more than Nolan Smith, now you have a problem. Or you have a good player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have a problem with, with Nolan specifically maybe, but we don't know what he is. No, we don't. Yeah. We don't. But I mean, I think, I'd love to know what they think of Nolan. Obviously, they're saying we we believe in him. We think he's you know a really good player. Um, I wonder, you know, do they do they try harder to keep Reddick if they don't have any confidence in Nolan? I don't know. Probably not. Um, I think they're separate issues, but um, it would sure be. Uh, Alex is saying Aaron Rodgers got eighty one bucks in performance based pay <laughs> for his what did he played like five snaps. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not bad though. Yeah, like sixteen bucks a snap. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. Wouldn't be shocked, but not in my uh, not in my top spot. Okay, 
And two, you said you had offensive tackle. No, an offensive tackle three. Three, edge rusher two? Edge rusher two. Oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my two is cornerback, which I, I assume you have at one. Um, oh, I left it out. No, <laughs> I have cornerback at the top. Yeah, so uh, my top three in order of most likely to least likely. I have offensive tackle one, cornerback two, edge three. Yeah, and I have corner one, edge two, tackle three. So we're, we're I don't think we've ever agreed on something so closely uh, in all the years we've done the pod. We're, it is different, though. What, what was your reasoning for having corner first? I, th- I think it could line up where if they stay at 22, that is, that – they can they can address a position in need and get close to the best player available in that spot. I just think it makes sense. Um, I mean, we're we're so trained to think about need, and they don't really look at it quite like that. But uh, you know, I think Huey Wingo did some good things. I think Eli Ricks did some good things. Isaiah Rogers is coming in. Slay still pretty good, but man, this team really needs like an impact, young, big-time playmaking cornerback. So I think there's going to be one available at 22, and I just think that makes the most sense. I just I just think that's the way they're going to go. Yeah, and we've talked about some of the names before at corner. Uh, Cooper DeGene is going to have his individual workout next week. That'll be good to see uh, coming off. He had a, a, a broken leg at the end of the year, so he's healthy now. He's clear he's going to work out for everyone. Presumably, he's going to test very well. Uh, Nate Wiggins from Clemson might be there. Kool-Aid McKinstry from Alabama. Uh, Taryn Arnold and um, Quinion Mitchell, like we kind of think they're going to be gone, but you never really know. Like One of those guys could be available. Ennis Rakestraw from Missouri. There's a lot of first-round players who are going to potentially be available at corner. And when when you have a deep class, it pushes guys down. And at 22, you can get a guy who in a in a weaker corner draft might have been gone by then. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I just think it makes sense in a lot of ways. Yeah. So the reason I had offensive tackle first is I, I, I agree with you that the Eagles do not look at need as much as the rest of us. But there is a need yeah. <laughs> at offensive tackle. And it, it's kind of a, a need that's under the surface. Uh, even if you love both tackles and you should like Lane Johnson, best in the business, Jordan, my lot of very good left tackle. Lane doesn't play every game every year. I think it'd be foolish to expect him to play every game at this point. And even aside from his missing games, he's getting up there. He's 33. it will be 34. I think when the season starts. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, this is kind of their style is to yeah. think about, who's next and it doesn't mean it would be popular but there are some prospects who are going to be available who just kind of makes sense to me who, who do you like there like uh you. it was funny oh, i was on birds huddle a couple of weeks ago and they asked me like the most likely player at 22 and i said jc latham from alabama because he, he's a position they care about they think ahead and he's an offensive player from alabama like he he really just checks so many boxes uh, Marius Mims from Georgia, super athletic, might need some time to develop. Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma, uh, Troy Fatanu from Washington. We talked about, you know, potentially a, a tackle who can play guard. He's a really good example of that. So, like, he could, even though they might not think of him this way, they're not drafting a tackle who, you know, with the thought that he can play guard. But when you get him in the building and if you're not set at that right guard spot, I think that's very possible. Uh, and you alluded to that. That's why I haven't taken Jermaine Burton in the second round because they like guys from Georgia and Alabama, and he went to both. So uh, he's my he's my he was my pick at fifty in my mock that that uh, showed up on our site this morning, I believe. But uh, yeah, I if you were Howie, based on who's probably going to be available, who's who's your pick? I'm me, or am I, I'm Howie? You're Howie. Well, I'm you're Howie. Howie's role, but your your brain. Oh, okay. Um, like if you're making the pick, I mean, it, I think it really just. I I don't know if I can do that because it really depends on who's there. Yeah, but I'm saying who you think will be there, who's expected to be there. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I, like <laughs> I'd probably go Fatano. Interesting from Washington. Um, but like the, it's it's almost impossible to play that game because we don't know who's going to be there. No, we don't. And uh, uh, but I, I think the point here is like any of those positions makes sense based on whoever's higher on their board. Right. I don't think they'd shy away from any of them. I agree. How about you? Put yourself in Howie's shoes. Prime McKinstry. I'll go Kool Aid. Look, I really like the player, and I I think it's been to his detriment that everyone's looking at Terry on Arnold right now as a higher ceiling player, but he look, he battle tested in the sec. Uh, he did not get thrown at nearly as much as Arnold, like sec quarterbacks respected him. Uh, I, I think if he keeps his eyes on quarterbacks, which they would ask him to do, I, yeah, I, I would really like that pick. I think he'd be a high level player. Yeah. I mean, not I to- mocked him to the Eagles cause I think it's, it's very much in play. But I, I, no, I did too. But I, I think it depends on who's there. Sure, of course it does. Did you not look at my mock draft? No, I wanted mine to be. You know, I don't look at any mock drafts. I, I like to be. I, I don't like to um, be influenced by, you know, other mock drafts. I don't. I just narrow view. Just who who do I like in this spot? In this spot? In this spot? Okay. I look at every mock draft. I know you do. <laughs> I play with the the Pro Football Focus mock draft simulator. That is pretty every, cool. Every day. <laughs> sometimes I make trades. Sometimes I, yeah. And I, look, I understand that there's this. Uh, I think mock drafts are just a fun way to frame around the draft. Like I, I see some people get like kind of surly about them. Like this yeah. will never happen. Yeah, of course it'll never happen. No one knows what's going to happen, but it's it's a fun way to talk about the draft and to get excited for it. I, I had the Eagles taking Keely Ringo a year before in my in my previous year's mock draft, mm-hmm. uh, but I had him in the first round. Um, but they did take him. Um, the you interesting want partial about credit for that. I'm sorry. Do you want partial credit for that? No, I don't think I deserve it. But okay. um, the thing is, like every mock draft is based on need. Well, this guy, they need this, they need this. And, but teams don't look at it like that. Most teams don't look at it like that. Well, so, I know. I think they do a little bit, a little bit. It's but, like, and it's also like best player available is kind of a myth too. Best player it's like available at a position of, of importance or value or need. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the difference. It's not like just purely best player. Um, sure. It's best player within a stringent set of criteria. Fair. I'm excited for the draft. I know you are. You don't get it. Do you get excited for the draft? I How would you rate the uh, like the the off season, the two off season acquisition elements, free agency or the draft? Do you, do you have a preference of which one you kind of like more? Uh, interesting question. I think I enjoy free agency more. Yeah, because I think it's the first time you really learn what teams. Are thinking about their players it's fair and to me the free agency and it, it it's like it really it's when you really turn the page from one year to the next because you're you're letting guys go and you're adding new guys and you're just kind of it's it's our first chance to know what they think of these guys so yeah i, I go free agency um i think the supplemental draft is up there pretty <laughs> uh, yeah not much use for that anymore the day the um, the day the schedule comes out is one of my favorite days. Although it was more when I was traveling, you know, because then you start what married am I going to stay in? You know, can I get a nonstop flight? Do you know, when is there a red eye from? Is there still a red eye from San Francisco to to Philly? Yeah, see, I don't like that as much because that's when my evil twin comes out and books all my travel for the year. That I then have to to actually fly on those six a.m. flights during the season. <laughs> Yeah, red eyes seem like such a good idea in May, and then <laughs> yeah. get to the air, you get to LAX at like you know midnight. You know, oh, like, no what? sleep, and you go, "What? I don't know about this." Yeah. All right, you got anything else here? No, I I, I wanted to mention Carson Wentz signing with uh, the Chiefs with Big Red. Yeah, uh, what do you make was, of that? I thought it was April Fool's joke at first. Um, I honestly, because you just don't know anything that comes out yesterday. Um. 
It's really interesting. And, you know, Andy, I'll never forget when Andy told me when, when he signed Jeff Garcia, which is now 18 years ago, he said, uh, you know, I don't mean to, to sit here and have Mike McMahon take strays, but he's like, I realized that backup quarterbacks really one of the more important positions on the field, on the roster. Um, and then Garcia, you know, obviously went five and one at the end of 06 and won a playoff game. Uh, won five straight starts, six straight starts, including that win over the Giants. And and then, you know, he he had pretty good backups. You know, it was Vic or whoever. Um, he had good backups, and he had backups that won some games. Um, I think Carson Wentz is probably one of the better backups in the in the league. Uh, you know, I'm, I I don't know if he'll ever be a starter, like a full time opening day starter again. I mean, gosh, he's what is he? Thirty one now, which is yeah, he's thirty one. We're going into his eighth season, maybe. Um, so I, I think that kind of that ship has kind of sailed. But um, I, he can come in and win you a game. And ninth season, not going to his ninth season. Yeah. yeah, sixteen. Wow, how did that happen? I got to count that up again. <laughs> you can't right. see my hands are below the desk. I'm, I'm using, <laughs> I got, I'm using fingers here. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, if you're a quarterback, you're going to want to want to play for Andy Reid. Um, it's fascinating to me how like two two eras of Eagles history kind of coming together. Um, but because of that, like I think. It makes sense. He's played in an offense with similar structure, similar terminology. Sure. Having played under Doug. So I like from that sense, the marriage really makes a lot of sense. It does. And Doug was Andy's quarterback's coach and offensive coordinator. And um, yeah, well, I, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, he could, who knows how many Super Bowl rings he'll have. He's already got one without playing. <laughs> he might get a couple more. He earned that one, by the way. He absolutely did. Yeah. He absolutely did. He played that stretch. That stretch in 17 is might be the best extended stretch, like 10 games of quarterback play in Eagles history. Yeah. Maybe Foles in, in 13, but Carson in, in 17 is right up there. Yeah. I, I saw some people saying he's chasing a ring. Well, he has one, and he, he did earn it. Like. He did. Yeah. But it would be interesting if Mahomes gets hurt like late in the season and Carson comes in, like does what Foles did to him. And yeah, I think Mahomes will be able to handle it. <laughs> yeah. I think he'd be okay. Yeah. He's got, he's got a few, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting. And look, I, I, I like Carson. I wish him well and you know, good for him. Yeah. I think for the rest of his career, we'll always be following it. With a close eye, I'll get, yeah. You know, yeah. How he well, he, he's how many teams has he been with now? This is his he's, fifth team in five years. Yeah, with Rams, Washington, Eagles, yeah. Colts. Eagles in in twenty, and then yeah, Colts, Washington, Rams, and now Chiefs. And Nick Foles also played for the Eagles, Colts, Rams, and Chiefs. Mm -hmm. But not Washington yet. <laughs> But Mariota did. <laughs> All right. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please do us a favor. Rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that like button. Subscribe there as well. Any final words? No, I just I can't believe we just did a 64 minute podcast in, in like in early April. Yeah, we'll do it again on Thursday. Take care, everyone. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan. We'll talk to you soon.